Well, welcome to another Friday night. We're continuing our series on reparenting, which is the process of healing in recovery from trauma that we have to learn to parent ourselves. And today we're going to come to the subject of habits. So every parent, if they want their child to grow up in a healthy way, realizes quickly that they have to teach their child healthy habits. They need a healthy morning routine, which has things they do every day, habits. They need an after-school routine. They need a bedtime routine. All of those things are healthy habits that you want to teach your child to build a foundation for them of a healthy life. And so what you realize is the earlier you teach your child healthy habits, the better chance they have to have a healthy life as an adult. And research has shown that that is true, that the earlier a child learns healthy habits, the better chance they have at a healthy adult life. And healthy habits are really all about the daily routine I have to meet my 12 needs. And meeting my 12 needs is the building of a healthy life. It's taking care of myself. It's parenting myself. So I want to talk about habits because, again, complex trauma messes up healthy habits and the ability to build healthy habits, and it creates a lot of bad habits. So a habit is a settled or a regular tendency or something you do regularly, something you repeat as on a daily basis, or for some habits goes a bit further and it is referred to as a compulsion. It's something that you don't want to do, but you do it anyway. So you don't want to snack at night, but you can't stop yourself from snacking. You don't want to keep smoking, but you can't stop that compulsion to light up. So it can become this powerful compulsion in your life that is very difficult to stop. So you can see very easily that we can have good habits that result in good consequences in our life. They bring about good things, healthy things. Or you can have bad habits, things that bring about negative consequences, things that hurt us, but we just keep doing them. And so habits is a very important topic to think through because reparenting means stopping bad habits and developing good habits, the things that will build a healthy life. I think it's important to understand there's three ways that habits develop in our life. So the first way would be our limbic brain. And, and this typically is where bad habits develop. So the limbic brain is all about feeling good, instant gratification. So what happens is, let's say you have food. Food, you eat food and it causes your brain to secrete dopamine. You get pleasure from it. And so what can happen then for some people is they now use food not just to feed their body, they now use food to chase the good feeling, the release of dopamine, to feel a little bit better. It's emotional eating. So now they eat food when they don't really need to eat food to feed their body, but they eat it to feel good, and they just start a pattern. So every night they get home or, or they're watching TV, and they start to snack. They're eating, and it feels good. There's an instant reward. And so when there's an instant reward in the brain, the brain wants to repeat the action. And every time they keep repeating it, what they're doing is creating a brain circuit so that basically they have created a habit. But what I want you to understand is they've taken a good thing, food, and now they're using it in the way food wasn't designed to be used. They're using it just to feel dopamine or to feel good. 
And now they have a brain circuit so that every time at a certain time of the day or whenever they're feeling certain emotions, brain circuits go off and they go, I want to eat. And now they have a habit. And it can become a compulsion for them. So that whenever that brain circuit is triggered by an emotion, by a time of day, by an event, it just goes off and creates this powerful urge to eat. So what I want you to understand with that is that habit, so every day at this time of day you start eating, it can mimic an addiction. Initially, it's not an addiction. The brain hasn't totally changed its chemistry, but it is definitely a habit. And if they continue in the habit, it can become an addiction. So in the early days, habits mimic addiction, but there's a difference. But over time, habits can turn into addictions. So the limbic brain, the reward system of dopamine, instant gratification can cause us to develop habits that release dopamine. And most of those become bad habits. They give instant gratification, but there's more and more negative consequences. The second way that habits develop is in the cortex brain. And that's where you sit down and say, in order to meet my 12 needs, in order to have a healthy life, I need to do this every day. I need to exercise. I need to meditate. I need to read some type of stuff that helps me remember truth to learn new things. So I need to develop this daily routine. Now, it may not give instant gratification to go and have a workout, to sit down and read or meditate. It doesn't give instant dopamine. But you're not doing it for instant gratification. You're doing it because you know in the long run it builds a healthy life. So you force yourself to do it. It comes out of the cortex. This is healthy. It doesn't matter how I feel. I am going to do it and I'm going to do it every day. And as you do it every day, what begins to happen is you create a habit. You create a brain circuit. And you begin to experience benefits. You don't experience the benefits immediately. You don't experience good feelings immediately. But over time, you experience benefits and good feelings. The third way that habits develop is from survival coping methods, in survival mode. The things you had to do to survive, the patterns that developed. And so if dad came home always angry, always ready to become abusive, you developed habits. So as soon as you heard dad coming in the back door, you would do, do this, this, this. And that you repeated every day. And that became a habit. And so now what can happen is every time you see or hear an angry person that triggers that brain circuit and you follow that habit even today. What I want you to understand about that is the purpose of that pattern was not necessarily instant gratification. It might have given you some. You might have gone to your room and eaten and got a little bit of dopamine from that. But the, it was still a limbic brain thing because it gave you instant safety. And instant safety in and of itself provided some gratification because there was a release of stress. You, you all of a sudden went, okay, I'm away from that. I can relax for a little bit. And it did give you some gratification at that level. Now let me just highlight a couple important things from that. So bad habits start in the limbic brain. It's all about that reward system stuff. So that is so important to understand. So it's all about instant gratification or instant safety, but it's limbic brain. Good habits start in the cortex. So understand that, okay? 
Bad habits, instant gratification, instant safety, but bad long-term consequences. Good habits, not necessarily good feelings instantly, but good benefits long-term. Okay, next thing that you have to understand is, if you have a bad habit that started in your limbic brain, the only way to stop that bad habit, to break that habit, is you got to get into your cortex, figure out what to do, and your cortex has to overpower your limbic brain. As long as your limbic brain is still running the show in your life, that bad habit will remain. So you have to strengthen the cortex in order to develop healthy behavior and break bad habits. I think it's also important to understand that we can have habits that are also attitude habits. So we tend to think of habits just as actions or behaviors. But you can also develop the habit of waking up and just saying, you know what, what am I grateful for? Or when you meet somebody, that your first response to that person is an open kindness, a smile on your face. You can develop that habit. It's an attitude. Or you can develop attitude habits that are bad, that you just want to be angry all the time. And that becomes a habit to be angry. Or you're just negative about everything. That becomes a habit. And so habits don't just have to be actions. They can also be attitudes. And that is so important to understand. Now what I want to do is give you some just extra stuff around habits through different quotes that show you the importance of habits that show you just some other information about habits. So somebody has said this, good habits are the key to success. Bad habits are the unlocked door to failure. So in other words, if you want a successful life, you gotta build good habits. If you want your life to head towards failure, just give in to bad habits. So profound. Somebody else, successful people are simply those with successful habits. So true. Or your habits will determine your future. Same, th same thing, just saying it a little different word, way. But basically what you do every day, your habits will determine where you're going to be in five years in your life. Somebody else. Depending on what they are, our habits will either make us or break us. We become what we repeatedly do. And Aristotle said this, We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. It's the result of repeatedly doing good, healthy things. Somebody else says this, We first make our habits then our habits make us. So true. Somebody said this, good habits are hard to develop, but easy to live with. Bad habits are easy to develop, but hard to live with. The habits you have and the habits that have you will determine almost everything you achieve or fail to achieve. So profound. And then this, you'll never change your life until you change something you do daily. The secret of your success is found in your daily routine. Bad habits are like a comfortable bed, easy to get into, but hard to get out of. And another quote from Aristotle, 95% of everything you do is the result of habit. And I think that's got a lot of truth in it. And this is just an important fact that comes out of the research around habits. It takes three weeks to break a habit, six weeks to develop a new habit, and 36 weeks to hardwire this new habit or create those brain circuits. That is so important to understand when you're trying to break 
habits, bad habits, and create new habits. So let me go to something very practical. What are some good habits? So you, there's actually books that have been written on the habits of highly successful people. So let me give you some of the habits that most successful people incorporate into their daily routine. And you can give it thought as to what you're going to do with that in your own life. Pretty well, everybody who's successful has found value in taking time each day to meditate, to exercise, wake up early, consistently get a good sleep. So that means going to bed at the same time, basically getting up at the same time, and the right number of hours of sleep, do some reading every day, pray, do some journaling, go through some gratitude stuff that they're grateful for, go over in the morning, review or set the, what their things to do today, their priorities for, for those things. So those are kind of the activities, but here's what's going on underneath. That they're developing the habit of truly connecting with themselves, with their higher power, and with their partner if they have one, or with some other person. So they're making three important connections as part of their daily routine. And that then means the habit of choosing to develop the habit of being present to yourself, being present to your higher power, being present to somebody else. That becomes a habit. With that, there's the habit of mindfulness, where they are reviewing, how am I doing? And they're taking an emotional inventory. They're checking their stress level, their energy level, where they're vulnerable, how tired they are. They're checking the, for anxiety, depression, anger, all of those things. They're taking that inventory so they're self-aware. And then most people develop the habit of doing something on their wish list that they really don't feel like doing. So they're choosing to force themselves to do something every day they would not naturally want to do. That becomes part of their habit. And then they learn to develop the habit of good boundaries. So enforcing good boundaries around TV, social media, food, boundaries around people. So they just develop all of those habits in their daily life, internal boundaries. So those are the habits of very successful people. Now, let me break that down for you this way. For most of us, a good part of our day is taken up with work. So we don't get really a lot of freedom about kind of a personal routine, about things we like to do to meet our 12 needs and, and to have a healthy life. That is reserved usually for our mornings or our evenings or a combination of both. And so when we look at developing healthy habits, what it might help you to do is just think of it in terms of my morning routine and my after work evening routine. Now some people are naturally morning people and so they do really well with morning routines. Others aren't morning people but they do really well with evening routines. So Jay Shetty who's written a book called Think Like a Monk which is a very helpful practical book has given the, the time and it basically defines a morning or an evening routine that it needs to include four things t-i-m-e so t you need to choose a time every day just to be thankful secondly you need i insight so do some reading listen to a podcast but you are gaining learning, you are gaining new insights 
into yourself, into life. M, meditate. You take time to get quiet, to center yourself, to think, to pray, to ponder what's going on in your life. And then E, exercise. So yoga, go for a walk, have a workout, whatever works for you. But that time for many is a very helpful thing just to focus on building those four things into your morning or evening routine. Now let me give you a caution to people coming out of complex trauma when it comes to developing good habits. Number one, for people coming out of complex trauma, when you develop good habits and get a healthy routine, you will go through times when it feels boring. Because it doesn't have the drama. It takes drama out of life. It takes chaos out of life. And so it will have an element of feeling boring and something in you will want to quit. So be aware of that tendency. Secondly, all healthy habits, we will reach times where it's easy to go through the motions, but our heart's not in it. So we will get up and we will do our meditation, our prayer, our reading, but we're not present. We're, our heart's not in it. We would rather be doing something else. We're just going through the motions. It's not really touching our soul. It's not impacting us. And so be aware of that tendency. And so what I encourage you to do is practice mindfulness around that. If all of a sudden you realize, wow, I'm just going through the motions of my morning routine. My heart's not in it. I wish I could be doing something else. Be curious. Why? What's going on in my life? And just explore that. Don't judge yourself. Just be curious about it. But then stop and say, okay, let's get present. Let's get in the moment. Let's not be over here or over here in the past or the future. Let's be in the present. And force yourself to put your heart into it. You may not feel like it. But boy, you will be rewarded well if you do. And so that is such an important thing to be aware of. Now for some of you, you are at the point of your life saying, I wish I had all good habits, but I got a bunch of bad habits. How do I break those bad habits? And I think you know there's not going to be three quick easy steps. To breaking bad habits. Bad habits, it can be very difficult to break it because you've created brain circuits that are built in the limbic brain that are built with a reward system and they become compulsions. And so breaking bad habits is a lot harder to do than it is to talk about. So start with Realizing that there's some bad habits that you cannot break all on your own. You can't break them by sheer willpower. Be aware of that. You might need help. And so you might need to talk to a friend about it and say, could you just kind of walk with me for a while as I break this bad habit? And we can do some stuff together at times when I'm inclined to give in to this bad habit and you, I can be accountable to you or you can join a program that will just help you to develop tools to break the habit but be aware you may not be able to do it all by yourself secondly be aware of the times of the day when you're most vulnerable to give in to that habit so the times of the day when that brain circuit gets triggered so it could be when you're all alone in the evening, just being alone. Or it could be just you're done work and you get home and as soon as you get in the door, you just start doing bad habits. Or it could be when you're feeling stressed. It could be whatever. Be aware of the times when you 
are vulnerable. And if it's a time of the day, or if it's around certain emotions, then come up with a plan to change that. So if every day you get home from work and the minute you get in the door you start eating, you want to sit down and watch TV and then you can't stop, what am I going to do to change that? So maybe instead of going home, I need to go and visit somebody. Maybe as soon as I get in the door, I need to do this right away. Something else that would be enjoyable. I'm going to begin to change it up. All of those things become very, very important to think through. Come up with a realistic plan. So a person who's wanting to quit smoking. Some people can quit cold turkey, but others can't. And so if you've tried to quit cold turkey, but it just has never worked for you, don't keep beating yourself up that you can't quit. Think of another way to try to quit. Maybe you've got to slowly wean yourself off. All kinds of different things, but have a realistic plan. And then, for many bad habits, what you need to do is not just focus on quitting the habit, but putting something else in its place at that time. So instead of coming home and just eating, I'm going to come home and go right into doing some exercise or go right into journaling. Whatever it is, replace it. So you're not just sitting there saying, don't, don't eat, don't eat, don't eat. You replace it with an activity. Next, get out of your limbic brain. Get into your cortex. And in your cortex, remind yourself of the truth. Play the tape to the end. If I give in to this, it will give me instant gratification, but I'm going to regret it tomorrow. If I say no to this, it's going to be hard, but I'm going to be thankful tomorrow. So get into your cortex is so important. Something that helps a lot of people is f what you focus on when you're feeling that compulsion, when that, when that craving is there. So <clears throat> that craving is giving what we refer to as the siren song, that beautiful, alluring song that's saying, follow me, I'll make you happy. And it's all a lie. But how do you defeat the power of that song? You focus on a more beautiful song. So you focus your attention not on the compulsion, not on what it's trying to draw you into feeding, but you begin to focus on something else that is beautiful. The joy of that conversation with your children and seeing how much it impacted them and how happy they were to connect with you. The joy of sitting with a group of people who, who that you're connecting with and, and to feel the level of sharing and, and the closeness and feeling like you finally belong. Focus on things that will overpower the compulsion. And then I would encourage you each morning and then even through the day to do some mindfulness. How am I doing? Am I vulnerable today? What's my stress level at? What's my anger level? What's my loneliness at? How am I doing spiritually? How am I doing emotionally? All of those things, just do that inventory every day so you're aware of where you're at. And then accountability is often so important. And then, I think it's helpful at times to go, why did I originally start eating? What need was I trying to meet? And so it wasn't just for food, it wasn't just necessarily for dopamine, but take it deeper. Why was I needing extra dopamine? Why did my brain want to keep going back to that? Was it because my life didn't have much pleasure, much happiness? I had a lot of painful emotions in my childhood. And so food became an escape. Food became the only thing that gave me pleasure. Food became the thing that helped me cope with the other pain. And so it became a response to pain. Okay, so now instead of using food, I need to find other tools, healthy tools, to deal with painful emotions, 
to deal with stress, to deal with feeling alone. So begin to understand why you started that habit in the first place. And then understand your triggers today, the things that trigger that brain circuit. So it could be when you're angry, it could be when you're stressed, it could be when you're alone, it could be when you're tired. Understand your triggers. But then understand this, one of the best ways of breaking habits is to think, think of it in terms of attachment theory. Because what is happening in a bad habit is you are connecting with a, with a substance. You're connecting with an activity that's giving dopamine. Part of what's really needed is you need healthy connection. Connection with yourself, with another person, with your higher power. That will release dopamine as well. So you're really looking for connection at that time. So find healthy connection. And be aware that to break bad habits, that often the thing you need to do the most in order to break that habit is the thing you're going to feel the least like doing. So when you get home in that five seconds that you decide, what am I going to do next? And you normally would either get food or go start watching TV. You need to be able to say, okay, the thing I feel like doing the least right now is sitting down and reading or meditating but that's probably what I need to do the most. And when you do it, you're going to find the reward that's going to gradually come out of that. Another thing that's helpful to understand in breaking bad habits is bad habits cause you to be double-minded. Part of you wants to do the bad habit, part of you doesn't. And so the goal is, I want to get to a point of being single-minded. I want to get to a point of I only want to do the good habit, 100%. How do I get to single-minded? So that's where I, the siren song, I focus on the good stuff. I, I get focused on the benefits of the good stuff. I play the tape out to the end for the bad stuff. But I surrender. And surrender means, if you want to think of it in very practical terms, I let go of that. I go, that is not going to give me happiness. That, I, I just let go and I totally trust this new way. I'm not going to trust the old way anymore. And I surrender to this healthy way and trust it. So that is very important. Now let me just add this. There's going to be some habits that even if you do all of that, you're still not going to break. I would encourage you Seek out a therapist that can really help you dig down as to what is going on that's making this so hard for you to break. And often there will be a trauma connection. And so for a lot of people that come into our LIFT or REACT programs, they have developed some bad habits they cannot break. And they don't understand, and we help them understand the connection to some of their deep wounds and their deep needs. So let's end with creating healthy habits. So let me start with this. Don't come out of this talk today and say, oh, I, okay, I'm going to start 50 new good habits this week. That is probably not realistic. Don't try to change everything all at once. Just say one at a time. I am going to start this new activity as part of my daily routine this week. Okay? But then you might have to say, I got to break this down into small, doable steps. So your goal might be I would love to read an hour a day, just fill my mind and my soul with stuff that feeds me. But an hour a day is too much to start with. So you might say, you know what? Instead of the 15 minutes I spend scrolling through my phone on Facebook, I'm going to start today by replacing that with 15 minutes of reading. And that's doable. So start with doable steps. 
Okay, then make sure that when you decide to start a new habit, a healthy behavior, you're not making it just out of your limbic brain. So a lot of people, after they've been eating too much and gained weight, and they've got the snack habit, they are disgusted with themselves. They're in their limbic brain. They're feeling guilt. They're feeling shame. And they go, I'm going on an exercise program. I'm going on a diet. I'm starting new habits. But they're making that decision out of their limbic brain. And what happens with that is they will start their diet, their exercise program, and do really well for a couple weeks. But then the limbic brain loses its intensity and it peters out their program. So you have to get into your cortex. And what you have to say is, okay, I'm going to start an exercise program. Not just because I'm feeling crappy right now, because, but because it will lead to a healthy life. But I know part of me is not going to want to do that. And it's not going to give me an instant gratification every time I exercise. In fact, some days it's going to be the last thing I feel like doing. So what am I going to do? I need a realistic plan that will get me doing an exercise activity every day for the next while. So in your cortex, you think it through. You think through the potential roadblocks and obstacles and internal hindrances and you lay out a plan, you find accountability, all of those things. So part of that is the next one. As you think through, I need to have an exercise program, a lot of people find resistance. Or I need to start reading more. Or I need to start meditating or journaling. There's internal resistance. Find out what's going on there. What's holding me back? What in me why don't I want to do that? And it could be because I might miss out on something over here. Because I might have to give up something. Because it's going to take a lot of work and I just want an easy life. Figure out what is causing the resistance. That is so important. And then be realistic. So let me go back to this. You come home from work and you go, I want to start using my evenings to meditate, to do some reading, to do some, go for a walk, to talk with my partner for a while, journal a little bit, and you come home from work and you're tired. And you go, I just need a half hour to relax, so I'm going to watch Netflix for half an hour. The minute you sit down and start to relax, your hope of ever getting off that couch is gone. So your hope of ever reading, meditating, walking, it's not going to happen. Because as soon as you sit down on that couch, other forces take over that are too powerful to overcome. So when you think through new habits, be realistic and say, okay, if I'm going to change my evening... I can't come home and, and have a half hour sitting on the couch. Because as soon as I have that half hour, I'm done. And there's not a hope I'm going to get up and do the other things. So as soon as I get home, I'm going to have to forego that half hour on the couch. Maybe I can have it at the very end of the night, but i got to go right into my activity if I ever hope to do it. Remove temptations. So if you're trying to stop snacking, get rid of the potato chips. Get rid of all the other snack foods from the house. And you might, not, might have somebody else do some shopping for you for a while so you won't be tempted to buy them when you're getting groceries. So remove temptations as best you can. But then it's important to think about how will you respond if you fail? And this is where a lot of people start in a downward spiral that just prevents them ever getting back on track. There is a chance, a good chance, that you're going to fail when you start building new habits. The normal response is to beat yourself up. The normal response is to get discouraged. The normal response is to feel hopeless. I, I'm never going to get this. 
So you need to be able to say, I need to change how I respond when I fail. So learn from it. So some people find value in journaling. Okay, why did I give in and not do this new good habit? And why did I give in to the old habit? What was going on inside of me? Understand that. What could I do differently? What could I have done differently? So that next time, tomorrow, I won't do the same thing. So learn from it. But then don't beat yourself up. Be gracious to yourself. Then the next thing is get support. Tell your friends, I'm planning to do this new routine in my evenings or in my mornings. Um, I really want you guys to know about it. I want you to check up on me and look to them for support. It's also beneficial for many to build in intrinsic motivation. So reward yourself. So if I go without eating snacks for a week, I am going to celebrate by giving myself permission to go and do this. A little reward. So that can be very helpful. Um, Or if I give in to this, here's going to be the negative consequences. And I need to remind myself of the negative consequences and how serious they are. Next, be patient. You don't get new healthy habits perfectly overnight. We know that for people wanting to quit smoking, the research says it takes an average of 13 times for people to quit. So it can be messy, it can be slow, it can be frustrating, but stick at it and eventually it can come. Well, that's the end of part one. I hope that just gives you some practical tools as you seek to build healthy habits in your life. We're going to take a short break, come back for part two, which is the Christian part. If you're not interested in that part, perfectly fine. We'll see you next week. Everybody else will be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. We're getting very close to the end of our story of Esther, the beautiful young woman who became queen of the Medo-Persian Empire, and then God used her to save her people from being destroyed. And so what we have seen is she's become aware of Haman's plan to destroy the Jewish people. She's taken a great risk in going to the king and asking him to meet her at a banquet with Haman. So we've gone through the first banquet, and the king said, Esther, what do you want? And she says, come to a second banquet. So we're coming to the climax of the story. We're coming to everything's been building up to the time now she's finally going to ask the king to save the Jewish people. So here's what it says. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. In other words, Esther, I like you. I just want to give you whatever you want. Carte blanche, just ask. So Esther Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. Now that would have just shocked the king. What do you mean? Your life's in danger? This is my petition, and spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet. 
because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes, you can imagine, he's shocked. What do you mean somebody's planning to kill you and your people? So he says that, Esther, who, who is he? Where, where is he? This man that's dared to do such a king thing. And Esther said, an adversary and an enemy. And then she turns and points this vile Haman. Whoa, you can just feel all of the air getting sucked out of the room. Haman was terrified before the king and the queen. In other words, in that moment, Haman knows it's all over. In 24 hours, Haman has gone from thinking that he's the greatest person around, he's going to get whatever he wants, he's going to succeed in wiping out the Jews, all of his dreams are going to come true, to right at that, th that moment, realizing none of that's going to happen. So when the king hears this, he gets up in a rage, he left his wine, and he went out into the palace garden. So he basically, I got to cool down. I got to think, what is going on here? I have just been hit with a bombshell. And so as he walks around the garden and he processes he begins to realize, I have been a fool to blindly trust Haman. I have been duped by a madman, a man who wants to kill my queen, a man who wants to kill Mordecai, who saved my life. But then, as he thinks about it, he goes, but if I correct this mistake... I'm going to lose face. I'm going to admit to the whole nation that I was duped by a madman, that I'm weak, that I am vulnerable to madmen, that I made a stupid mistake. And people will lose respect for me as a leader. So now he's in a quandary. What am I going to do? So it's a huge dilemma. So his mind is going, is there a way to judge Haman but not make it about his plan to kill the Jews. And he doesn't know the answer to that. But he walks back into the banquet room, and here's what he sees. Haman, realizing that the king had decided his fate, stayed behind, so the king is left to the garden. Haman stays with Esther, and he begs for his life. Now you have to rem remember that in that culture, they didn't eat their meals like we do. They didn't have tables and chairs where you sat on chairs and ate your meal. <clears throat> they had low tables along the floor and you reclined on your left side, propped your head on your left hand, and you ate with your other hand. So you were basically lying on the ground. And so when Haman stays behind and decides to beg, here's what he does. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they uncovered Haman's face. So Haman has gone and fallen on the same couch where the queen is. So you can construe that in two ways. He's going to try to kill her right there with the king out of the room, or he's going to try to sexually molest her. All of a sudden, the king says, here's my answer. I can bring Haman up on charges of trying to molest the queen. And that way I can get rid of him. Solution to the problem. And so, as soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. And what that meant was, he's going to get executed. It was an indicator of execution. So somebody comes forward, and this is quite the irony of the whole thing. Then Arbona, one of the king's units, said, you know what, king? 
Haman made a hundred foot pole and put it in his backyard and he had set it up to use to kill Mordecai, the very guy who spoke up to save your life. So the king says, huh, he's already got a pole set up a hundred feet high, put Haman on that pole. Use the pole he intended to use to kill Mordecai, the man who saved my life. And let's put him on that pole. And so something I want you to see is that when Xerxes hears about that pole, what he realizes is, I've just honored Mordecai. I've had a parade for Mordecai. All the while Haman was planning to kill Mordecai, this guy is a sneak. This guy has been doing stuff behind my back. This guy has been operating by a hidden agenda. This is the right thing to get rid of him. And so it confirms, learning about this 100-foot pole confirms to Xerxes the true colors of Haman. And so it's realizing, okay, I'm not just acting because of what Esther's told me. I am seeing this man based on his actions. And I am seeing that he is a madman. He is not a good man to have in my government. And so they decide to put Haman on that pole, but they say, you know what, let's get rid of his sons as well. Because they're all enemies of the Jewish people. And so that resulted in dealing with the enemy. What would happen next is the king wouldn't overturn Haman's law and lose face. What he did was write a second law which said, I give permission to the Jews to defend themselves on that day. And we'll see that next time. Let's pray. Father, just thank you that you gave Esther the wisdom of how to handle this very difficult situation so that the king came to see the reality of the situation and the right decisions were made. Just thank you for the way you often work in hidden ways that we're not even aware of. And just thank you for your faithfulness. Amen. Well, that's the end of another Friday. Thank you for being here with us.